And you see that, that you see what an important factor that doesn't say anything to them. They don't know what you mean. Tell Walt also to take the very prime minister's wire and what he's asking for and see if we can clear that up in here. He says that what do you mean by so and so? What steps would you take? And tell Walt that I, was, I saw him and thought he was very good today. Be an important factor in our decision. And, and our purpose is to bring about a reduction in the level of violence that now exists. It is to save the lives of brave men and innocent women and children. It is to permit the contending forces to move closer to a political settlement. Tonight, I call upon the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union as co-chairman of the Geneva Conferences and as permanent members of the United Nations Security Council to all they can to move from the unilateral act of de-escalation I just announced toward genuine peace in Southeast Asia. The United States now, as in the past, is ready to send its representatives to any forum at any time to discuss the means of bringing this war to an end. Uh, let's have Walt outline the three or four steps we want to ask these folks to do, the United Kingdom. Do they call a Geneva Conference? Do they take it up in the Security Council specifically? You see what I mean? Not on this script, but later for that conference I have, 5 o'clock. One of our most distinguished Americans, Ambassador Averill Harriman, is my personal representative for such talks. In addition, I have asked Ambassador Llewellyn Thompson, who is returning from Moscow for consultation, to be available to join a... Cut out this A here. Gosh, I don't know who would do something like this. Looks like they'd see it when they're typing it. To join Ambassador Harriman at Geneva or any other suitable place. You get that? Gentlemen? Did yes. you all get that A in there? Yes. Just as soon as Hanoi agrees to a conference. I call upon President Ho Chi Minh to respond positively and favorably to this new step toward peace. It may be that Hanoi, having embarked on a major offensive, will not now enter into serious negotiations until South Vietnam and its allies demonstrate that the Communists cannot this spring or later destroy our will and our fighting power. I would consider eliminating that, Jim, because of our offensive, too, you see, now, at this point. Do you follow me? Ask Walt about that, if that shouldn't. If peace does not come through negotiations, it will come when Hanoi understands that our common resolve is unshakable and our common strength is invincible. Tonight, we and other allied nations are contributing 600,000 fighting men to assist 700,000 South Vietnamese troops in defending their country. In 1961, we provided limited military forces to, keep South Vietnam, to help South Vietnam meet a subversion, guided and supported from the North. Beginning in 1965, we committed ground forces as a direct response to the invasion of South Vietnam by the regular forces of North Vietnam they'd begun in the previous year. Yet our presence there has always rested on this basic belief. The main burden of preserving their freedom must be carried with the South Vietnamese themselves. We and our allies can only help to provide a shield behind which the people of South Vietnam can survive and develop. Of their efforts on their determination and resourcefulness, the outcome then will ultimately depend. That small, beleaguered nation has suffered terrible punishment for more than 20 years. What is this red sign there? Is that turn the page? Well, they ought to put it where you can see it. Uh, I'll have the pages here, I guess. I pay tribute once again to the great courage and the endurance of its people. South Vietnam supports Army forces of almost 700,000 men today, the equivalent of more than 10 million in our own population. Its people maintain their firm determination to be free of domination by the North. There has been substantial progress in building a durable government during the past three years. The South Vietnam of 1965 could not have survived the enemy's Tet Offensive of 1968. The elected government of South Vietnam survived that attack and is rapidly repairing the devastation that it wrought. The South Vietnamese know that further efforts are required to expand their armed forces, to move back into the countryside, to increase their taxes, to select the very best men they have for post, they have for post, what does that mean? Plural, plural for post? They have for civil and military positions. Or for best they have for civil and military responsibility. Cut out post end. To achieve a new unity within their constitutional government and to include in the national effort all those groups who wish to preserve South Vietnam's control over its own destiny. Last week, President Chu ordered the mobilization of 135,000 additional South Vietnamese. He planned to reach as soon as possible total military strength of some 800,000 men. 
To achieve this, the government of South Vietnam started the drafting of 19-year-olds on March the 1st. On May the 1st, the government will begin drafting 18-year-olds. Last month, 10,000 men volunteered for military service, two and a half times the number of volunteers during the same month last year. Since the middle of January, more than 48,000 South Vietnamese have joined the armed forces. Nearly half of them volunteer. All men in the South Vietnamese armed forces have had their tours of service extended for the duration of the war, and reserves are now being called for active duty. President Chu told his people last week, we must make greater efforts and accept more sacrifices because, as I've said many times, this is our country. The existence of our nation is at stake, and this is mainly a Vietnamese responsibility. He warned his people that a major national effort is required to root out corruption and incompetence at all levels of government. We applaud this evidence of renewed determination on the part of South Vietnam. Our first priority will be to support the effort. We shall accelerate the equipment, re-equipment of South Vietnam's armed forces to meet the enemy's increased firepower. This will enable them progressively to undertake a larger share of combat operations against the communists. On many occasions, I have assured the American people that we would send to Vietnam. I've told instead of assured. I've told the American people we've sent to Vietnam those forces that are required to accomplish our mission there. With that as our guide, we have previously authorized a force level of approximately 525,000 men. Some weeks ago, however, to help meet the enemy's new offensive, we sent over, we, we sent over, don't say where, we sent to Vietnam about 11,000 additional Marine and Airborne troops. They were deployed by air in 48 hours on an emergency basis. Artillery, tank, aircraft, medical, and other units needed to, I can't read this substitute you've got here, work needed to work with and support these infantry troops in combat did not accompany them. In order that these forces may reach maximum combat effectiveness, we should prepare to send during the next five months these support troops totaling approximately 13,500 men. A portion of these men will be made available from our active forces. The balance will come reserve component units, which will be called up for service. Action we have taken since the beginning of the year to re-equip the South Vietnamese forces to meet our responsibilities in Korea as well as in Vietnam, to meet price increases in the cost of activating and deploying reserve forces, to replace hel helicopters, provide the other military supplies we need will require additional expenditure. The estimate of those additional expenditures is, so get Clifford and see what, they, what figures. So in this fiscal year, well, you're going to have to get them in the next hour so you can mimeograph it because George is going to want them. In this fiscal year and three, two in, in the next fiscal year, these projected increases in expenditures for our national security bring into sharper focus the nation's need for immediate action. To protect the prosperity of the American people and the strength and stability of the dollar, to preserve the international monetary system and to reverse decisively the trend to increasing deficit in the federal budget and international balance of payment. On many occasions, I've pointed out that without higher taxes or decreased expenditures, next year's deficit would again be around $20 billion. I've emphasized the need to set strict priorities in our spending. I've stressed that failure to act promptly and decisively would raise strong doubts throughout the world about America's willingness to keep its financial house in order. Yet Congress has not acted, and today we face the sharpest financial challenge in the post-war era. They challenge the dollar's role as a keystone of international trade and finance. Yesterday, I received important news from the Secretary of the Treasury regarding the results of the Monetary Conference held this week in Stockholm. The major industrial countries at this conference took a big step toward creating a new international monetary asset that will strengthen the international monetary system. <coughs> but to make this system work, the United States must bring its balance of payments to or close to equilibrium. We must have a responsible fiscal policy. Enactment of tax bill now together with expenditure control would be a major contribution toward this end. At stake and in jeopardy, Jim, if I make all of this speech, what George has got this to, I want you to call this lady at Rivera, Texas, Mary Margaret Gussett, she used to be, and I think she's a doctor's wife, Ewart now, just beforehand, tell her that we want her to listen to that. And in jeopardy, you know who I'm talking about? Yes. It is a trade and payment system that since World War II has brought the free world the greatest era of prosperity and development it has ever experienced. Equally at stake is our own unprecedented seven-year prosperity, which has raised the real income of the average American after taxes, almost 30 percent in the past seven years. Again, as large as that, gosh, this is hard to read, Jim. You have no idea. It's just marked up every word, Nellie, you see. 
I just mark a word or sentence if there's one to hit it. You see, I can't, it doesn't mean anything. They're, all of them are marked, you see. And I can't see where a period is or not. Uh, the step for them is I just have to go on. We'll have to do it. We can't change it, but it's marking don't mean anything. You're going to mark them all. Point there is the steps we must take to convince uh, the Large world. that preceding 19 years. The steps we must take to convince the world are exactly the steps we must take to sustain our economic strength at home. In the past eight months, prices have risen. I told you to cut that out nearly twice as fast as the first half of 67. Let's cut that out. Yes, uh, Harry is rewriting that, and his revisions are not final enough to put on the teleprompter yet. Uh, in the absence of fiscal restraint, interest rates have reached new heights. The foundations of our prosperity are being threatened by delay. Now we must move from debate to action. There is, I believe, in both houses of Congress, a growing sense of urgency that the situation must be corrected. My budget in January was a tight one. It fully reflected the valuation of our most demanding need. But in these budgetary matters, the President does not decide alone. The Congress has the power and the duty to determine appropriations and taxes. taxes. Accordingly, the Congress is now considering proposals for reducing for reduction in our national budget by reviewing our appropriation request. As part of a program of fiscal restraint, that includes the tax surcharge. I shall approve appropriate reduction in January budget where, when, when, not where, when and if Congress so decides. One thing is unmistakably clear. If we are to secure and continue our prosperity in the months and years to come, our deficit must be reduced. Failure to act could bring on conditions that would strike hardest to those who are striving to help. These actions will not be easy or pleasant, but if they are not popular, they are essential. Now, that doesn't make sense. But even if they are unpopular or something, I guess that's all right, though. The times call for a measure of restraint in this land of plenty. I believe we have the character to provide it, and I plead with the Congress to act promptly to serve the national interest. I would say prudence, not restraint, wouldn't you say? We have the prudence to provide it. No, no, back up. The times call for prudence. Back up. Calls for time, the times call for a measure of prudence in this land of, go ahead, plenty. I believe we have the character to provide it, and I plead the Congress to act promptly to serve the national interest. Now, let me give you my estimate of the chances for peace. The peace will one day stop the bloodshed in South Vietnam, allow that people to rebuild and develop their land, permit us to turn more fully to our task at home. I cannot promise that the initiative I'm announcing tonight will be any more successful in achieving peace than the 30 others we have undertaken, than the more than 30 others. He said 38, I think, Joe Califano. It is only Hanoi that can decide the issue of aggression from without that has brought us into this war. It is our hope that North Vietnam, after years of fighting that has left the issue unresolved, will now cease its efforts to achieve a military victory and will join us in moving toward peace. And there may come a time when South Vietnamese on both sides are able to work out a way to settle their differences by free political choice rather than by war. As Hanoi considers its course, it should be in no doubt of our intentions. It must not miscalculate the pressures within our democracy in this election year. We have no intention of widening this war, but we shall not accept a fake solution to this long and arduous struggle and call it peace. No one can foretell the precise terms of an eventual settlement. Our objective in South Vietnam has never been the annihilation of the enemy. It has been to bring about a recognition in Hanoi that its objective, taking over the South by force, could not be achieved. We support a return to the essential provisions of the Geneva Accords of 1954 and the establishment of political conditions that would permit the South Vietnamese, all the South Vietnamese, to chart their course free of any external domination or interference. Gosh, if that's not State Department language there, George, I never saw it. Tonight, I reaffirm the pledge we made in Manila that we're prepared to withdraw our forces of South Vietnam as the other side withdraws its forces to the north, stops infiltration, the level of violence thus subsides. Our goal of peace and self-determination in Vietnam is directly related to the future of Southeast Asia. Much has happened to inspire confidence in Southeast Asia during the past 10 years. We have done all that we could to contribute to that confidence. A number of its nations have shown what can be accomplished under conditions of security. Since 1965, Indonesia, the fifth largest nation in the world, has had a government dedicated to peace with its neighbors and improved conditions for its own people. It's 65 or 66, Jim. I want to check that. We got 65 here. They said 66 last night, Indonesia. <laughs> Political and economic cooperation between nations has grown rapidly. Every American can take pride in the role we have played in Southeast Asia. We can rightly judge, as responsible Southeast Asians themselves do, that the progress of the past three years would have been far less likely, if not impossible, if American others had not made the stand in Vietnam. 
At John Hopkins University three years ago, I announced we would take part in the great work of developing Southeast Asia, including the Mekong Valley for all the people of the region. Our determination to help build a better land for men on both sides of the present conflict has not diminished. Indeed, the ravages of war have made it more urgent than ever. I repeat tonight what I said to John Hopkins, that North Vietnam could take its place in this common effort just as soon as peace comes. Over time, a wider framework of peace and security in Southeast Asia may become possible. The new cooperation on, wait, back up. The new cooperation, what? All the nations. Oh, the new, the new cooperation of the nations there it could be a foundation stone. <clears throat> for lasting peace in Asia requires a Southeast Asia composed of free, I'd cut out far, to say lasting peace in Asia. Free and independent nations living at peace with all others. Certainly friendship with the nations of such a Southeast Asia is what we seek and all that we seek. One day, my fellow citizens, there will be peace in Southeast Asia. It will come because the people of Southeast Asia want it. Those whose armies are at war today and those who, though threatened, have thus far been spared. Peace will come because Asians were willing to work for it and to sacrifice for it and to die for it. For let it never be forgotten. Peace will come along because America has sent her sons to help secure it. It has not been easy, far, it has not been easy, far from it. During the past four and a half years, it's been my fate and responsibility to be Commander-in-Chief. I've lived daily with the cost of war. I know the pain it's inflicted and the misgivings it's aroused. Throughout this period, I've been sustained by a single principle, that what we're doing now in Vietnam is vital not only to the security of Asia, but to our own security. Surely we have treaties which we must respect. Surely we have commitments which we must keep. Resolutions of Congress testify to the need to resist aggression in Southeast Asia. But the heart of our involvement in South Vietnam has always been American security. It's America's security that's what it's all about. And the larger purpose of our involvement has always been to help the nations of Southeast Asia become independent, self-sustaining members of the world community, at peace with themselves and with all others. With such an Asia, our country and the world will be far more secure than it is tonight. I believe that a peaceful Asia is far nearer to reality because of what America has done in Vietnam. I believe that the men who endure the dangers of battle there are helping the entire world avoid far greater conflicts than this one. The peace that will bring them home will come. Tonight I have offered the first in what I hope will be a series of mutual moves toward peace. I pray it will not be rejected by the leaders of North Vietnam. I pray that they'll accept it as a means by which the sacrifices of their own people may be ended. I ask your support, my fellow citizens, for this effort to reach across the battlefield toward an early peace. May God be with us. Good night.